Great. Uh, welcome to the Legacy of the American Revolution, a summer lecture series hosted by the Platypus Affiliated Society. Uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems, tasks inherited from the old, new, and post-political left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Uh, we have chapters around the world, from Los Angeles to Leipzig, Austin to Athens, and Chicago to Shanghai. In these times, we're hosting a number of online activities, such as this lecture series and chapter-based reading groups. To find out how to join an online reading group, please go to platypus1917.org. We also publish a monthly open submission journal, the Platypus Review. The latest issue is number 127, and it's online now, so please go and check it out. If you would like to submit an article to the Platypus Review, please send an email to editor at platypus1917.org. We would absolutely love to hear from you. And lastly, you can also check out our podcast, Ship Platypus Says, for your dose of the commentary on the commentary on the left, which is published regularly on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. So please share, subscribe, and give us a review there. Um, okay, without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce our lecture series. So the recent protests against police brutality have raised questions about the revolutionary character of the United States. Platypus argues that any revolution in America for human emancipation would have to build on the legacy of 1776 and not 1619. We see the erasure of 1776 as a fundamental acquiescence to defeat. And this is why today we are making the case for 1776 and the promise of liberty yet to be fulfilled. The red thread running through the lecture series is the persistence and legacy of the revolution. We ask, how does America remain a revolutionary society? How did each chapter of American history give a new impetus to the revolution that began in 1776? Our approach to the American Revolution and the subsequent history of the polity it founded is from the perspective of the bourgeois revolution and its crisis in the Marxist philosophy of history. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce our lecturer today, Chris Catron. Uh, Chris teaches Frankfurt School Critical Theory at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the Institute for Clinical Social Work. He is the original lead organizer, former president and chief pedagogue of the Platypus Affiliated Society. He quit the left in 1993. He's the last Marxist and your track coach. And we are going to take questions through the Q&A box after Chris's lecture. Thanks, Wensai. Um, okay, so I had uh, written up a lecture a few weeks ago. And I feel that um, that lecture, while I will draw upon it, has been, in the meantime, um, maybe affected by the course of events, um, specifically the uh, George Floyd protests and um, the wave of attacks on monuments to um, American political figures, including American revolutionary figures, including Thomas Jefferson, who is the subject of uh, my talk today. Um, so the title of my talk and the topic for today's lecture is the Jeffersonian Revolution. In other words, how to approach the American Revolution and its legacy through the historical figure of Thomas Jefferson. Um, so I was thinking about it in terms of um, Thomas Jefferson being a particularly controversial figure nowadays in a way that might not have been the case for the left uh, historically, previously. Um, and I was thinking about the characterization and depiction of the American Revolution in recent decades. So for instance, in terms of my uh, teaching experience, my experience as a teacher, both academically and also in Platypus, um, the pop cultural representations of the American Revolution that have been um, exemplary of our time were first uh, the HBO miniseries on John Adams, and that was uh, broadcast uh, and, and circulated, viewed under George W. Bush. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Broadway musical 
Hamilton. Um, so it's interesting that the two figures who have come to prominence in recent decades in the American Revolution and in our uh, historical memory of the American Revolution are actually Thomas Jefferson's main antagonists, um, John Adams and uh, Alexander Hamilton. So when uh, the popular culture has imagined the American Revolution for itself. It's been in the figures of John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, and it's not been in the figure of Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson is pretty poorly represented in both the Broadway musical Hamilton and in the John Adams HBO miniseries. So I had to, for example, tell my students, both academically and in Platypus, watch out with that John Adams miniseries. It's a distortion. It's actually a slander against Jefferson. And my students desperately tried to show how this was not the case, um, but in fact, it is the case. Now, the interesting thing is that while the John Adams imagination of the, of the revolution, the imagination of the revolution through the figure of John Adams might have cut against the grain of the George W. Bush presidency with which it was contemporaneous, of course, Alexander Hamilton, the depiction of Alexander Hamilton and the imagination of the American Revolution and the figure of Alexander Hamilton is very much about the Obama years. It's very much about Obama as a president. Um, so we might see Obama in Alexander Hamilton, especially as depicted in the Broadway musical. And we might see Alexander Hamilton in Obama. So I wanted to get at um, the, the currency, if you will, of Thomas Jefferson as a villain of American history, as imagined nowadays, for instance, in the anti-police brutality, um, anti-racist protests of recent weeks, that of course, um, Thomas Jefferson becomes in some way responsible for Donald Trump. And Donald Trump becomes responsible in some way for Thomas Jefferson, meaning an attack on a statue of Thomas Jefferson is a kind of a proxy for an attack on Donald Trump. Um, so I was thinking about that. I was thinking about you know, what it means that this is the case. And we can trace it actually very specifically. We can say Donald Trump is a Republican president of the United States. The Republican Party was founded in the 1850s. Um, and it harkened back to Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party, which is going to be uh, the focus of my discussion of Thomas Jefferson's role and uh, how he affected the legacy of the 1776 revolution subsequently in his presidency of 1800 to 1808, 1801 to 1809, um, that the Republican Party of which uh, Abraham Lincoln was the first president. Um, it was that, that name, the Republican Party, is a shortened version of Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party, which is, of course, the first real party established in the United States in, in American politics after the revolution. Um, whereas, actually, in a very false way, uh, people tend to remember Jefferson as somehow the founder of the Democratic Party. He's not. He's not. Um, the Democratic Party came later out of a split among the Democratic Republicans. And the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln and of the Civil War and Reconstruction is an attempt to refound Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party. Now, this is all relevant uh, because, of course, it falls to the Republican Party nowadays to uphold 1776 and figures like Thomas Jefferson, as well as Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant and others. Uh, whereas the Democratic Party, for instance, Hillary Clinton's vice presidential candidate in 2016, um, Tim Kaine from Virginia, has recently said that 
the U.S. did not inherit slavery as an institution from anywhere or anyone else, but rather that the U.S. invented slavery. So this is the, the Democratic Party of 2020 um, is going to say that slavery is not a legacy of prior civilization. It's not a legacy of British colonialism, even. It's really a homegrown American invention that claim, and very much in keeping with the 1619 project, the New York Times 1619 project of last year, which aimed actively to erase the founding of the United States through the revolution of 1776 and replace it, replace uh, the foundation of the United States with the introduction of African slaves in 1619 in the English colonies. It's very deliberate. Um, Nicole Hannah Jones, who is the sort of main kind of author or really curator of the 1619 project for the New York Times, recently said that the protests, the George Floyd protests, and even to call them riots, she said, yes, they're the 1619 riots. She claimed that positively, positively, of course. Meaning, the recent protests are an eruption of the legacy of 1619. Um, a spokesperson, I think the co-chair of New York City's Black Lives Matter organization, recently and controversially said that um, violence as a means for political ends in the United States uh, goes all the way back to 1776, goes back to the revolution. And so he tried to claim the American Revolution for Black Lives Matter and for the George Floyd protests and even sort of embraced the characterization of the protests as violent. Now, whether they're really violent is, is another question, but embraced it as um, a kind of uh, Malcolm X style statement, which is that um, political violence is as American as apple pie. It's in that kind of spirit, uh, more than in the spirit of actually claiming the revolutionary legacy of 1776. Um, so again, all of this is the context in which we are now uh, considering the American Revolution and its legacy. So this project by Platypus, um, this series of lectures, of which this is the third, was originally conceived earlier this year as part of a public forum panel discussion series on the American Revolution and the left. So we had a couple of iterations of that. We had one in New York, and we had one as part of um, the annual Platypus International Convention, which was held virtually. And we, we have plans to have a further iterations of this panel discussion with various speakers. Um, but this lecture series was conceived um, as supplemental to and an adjunct to and a way of getting at from another angle this topic of what the American Revolution means for the left. What's motivating that um, is not, by the way, some kind of uh, response to the 1619 project of last year, uh, but rather the kinds of questions about the United States and its history that come to the fore specifically in the context of a general election that we're going to have in November 2020, a presidential election, but more generally an election, an election for Congress as well as for uh, the presidency as well as a host of local state and municipal elections will take place. So whenever an election takes place, certainly when a major election takes place, the question of the American political order is raised. What is its, what is the, what are the roots? What is the foundation of the American political order? What does it represent? And of course, 
the United States is founded on a revolution, the revolution of 1776. Uh, and so 1776 comes into question whenever we have an election. We could say that 1776 has been in question, in fact, since 2016. Uh, since the results of the last election, specifically the surprise election, the unwelcome surprise election for many, certainly on the left, of Donald Trump. That it places the entire constitutional political order into some doubt. What is this thing that we're working with as a political system? Where does it come from? What does it represent? What is its historical legacy? What's the baggage that we're saddled with here? Um, one theme that I'm going to try to address today is the way that the left often counterposes 1776 with 1787. In other words, when the left is willing to embrace 1776 as truly revolutionary, what Lenin called um, a true emancipatory revolution, one of the few truly emancipatory revolutions. That's what Lenin called 1776. He also said that in the United States, freedom is most complete. So when the left embraces 1776, nowadays not so much, but when it has and when it does, it's usually counterposed to 1787, to the, to the Constitution. And the Constitution is usually taken to be a kind of counter-revolution, kind of Thermidorian moment. Um, interestingly enough, the Constitution came into effect in 1789, the same year, of course, as the French Revolution. Again, the French Revolution and the American Revolutions are usually counterposed to each other. They're usually um, contrasted with each other. 1776 is either denied as a revolution or it's qualified in some way, or when it is taken to be a revolution, it's seen as less radical than the French Revolution of 1789. I would say this is all false. It's false, this invidious comparison between the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789 is false. And the counterposition of the Revolution of 1776 with the Constitution of 1787 is also false. Thomas Jefferson, as a figure, is therefore extremely important in uh, dispelling this false opposition of the American and French revolutions and of the American Revolution with the constitutional political order that resulted from that revolution in 1787. Uh, I should say that there are a few waves of historiography that we're dealing with in terms of how we have to disinter the legacy of the American Revolution, of the 1776 Revolution, and also of the constitutional political order um, that came out of it, and Thomas Jefferson as a central figure in this story, um, the, the two most prominent waves of historiography that we have to contend with and overcome as serious, severe ideological obstacles are the new left, the 1960s new left, the kind of historical revisionism motivated by um, the new left generation, but also the revisionism of progressive liberalism of the FDR era. So in the wake of um, the change in the American political order, uh, the switch that took place with FDR when the Democrats became the progressive liberals and the Republicans became the conservative liberals, prior to that, the Republicans dominated politics in the United States from the Civil War onwards all the way up to um, FDR's election. And the Republicans were the progressive liberal party and the Democrats were the conservative liberal party. Conservative. And that is seen specifically in the role that the Democrats had in the South. In the defeat of Reconstruction, in the Jim Crow de jure segregationist order, they were the conservatives in 
the U.S. political system. The Republicans were the progressives that switched with FDR. Um, and that motivated a different regard for, a different look at American history. Um, and that's where, again, progressivism of the mid 20th century cast history in a certain light. And then the new left, both built upon that and modified and in certain respects rejected that progressive narrative that came out of the FDR New Deal era. And I think that Reed Kotlas uh, later on will be talking about the legacy of the American Revolution uh, for the 20th century left and specifically the um, Communist Party USA, how the Communist Party USA regarded the legacy of the American Revolution in this era, right, in the, in the post-World War I era in the 1920s and 30s, leading into the FDR progressive New Deal uh, Democrat era. So we are still living in a post-New Deal world. In other words, we're still living in, um, however modified in the era of neoliberalism, the predominance of the Democratic Party in U.S. politics. That was not, that experienced a crisis in the 60s New Left, but it actually was not changed. Um, even the Reagan Revolution didn't fundamentally change that. The Democrats are still the dominant party. And it is through the Democratic Party, therefore, that we necessarily and inevitably regard this history. Again, interestingly, Thomas Jefferson is usually lined up with the Democratic Party in a way that actually falsifies um, the real history. You might recall that in the 2016 election cycle, um, the Democratic Party had a tradition of what they called the Jefferson Jackson um, banquets or dinners. They would have uh, fundraising dinners throughout the United States and they were called the Jefferson Jackson events. And they dropped uh, Jackson in particular, Andrew Jackson in particular, who really is the founder of the Democratic Party. That's where the Democratic Party comes from. It comes from uh, the Jacksonian era. It comes from Jacksonian democracy, which will be the subject next time of uh, Pam Nogales' lecture. Um, specifically, they wanted to get rid of the Jackson appellation, but they ended up getting rid of Jefferson as well. The Charlottesville protests of 2017 uh, regarding the statue of Robert E. Lee being removed. The protests by the right against the removal of Robert E. Lee's statue and the counter protests by the left uh, was an occasion for Donald Trump to say they're calling for removing monuments to the Confederacy today, but where will it end? Tomorrow it will be George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And at the time, this was seen as hyperbole. This was seen as um, demagogic exaggeration. And of course, it was seen as some kind of a cover for the, for the right, for the right's uh, embrace of the Confederacy in defense of the statue of Robert E. Lee. Um, but turned out to be prescient. In other words, the logic of, of unfolding events, specifically as a function of anti-Trump protests, protests in the Trump era, therefore pr protests that are directed more or less against Trump, um, that Thomas Jefferson was going to be a target of this. So stepping back a moment, how does Thomas Jefferson um, help us understand the relationship between the revolution, the American constitutional order, and also the relationship between uh, the American and French revolutions, the revolution of 1776 and the revolution of 1789. Well, of course, he is literally a protagonist, a figure in both revolutions. So he is, of course, uh, the one commissioned by the committee asked to draft the Declaration of Independence uh, that was declared in 1776. 
And he's also the uh, ambassador of the newly independent United States to France in the years leading up to the French Revolution in the years immediately preceding. Um, and he also serves as a Secretary of State of the United States under George Washington um, during the radical period of the French Revolution in which, as we'll get to, he expresses his sympathy for the Jacobins. Um, he's also a, a co-drafter with Lafayette and the Abbe Sayez of the Declaration of Rights of Human Beings and Citizens in the French Revolution, which is of course itself inspired by both the Declaration of Independence and by the US Constitution. The, um, the Declaration of Rights of Human Being and Citizen in the French Revolution takes direct inspiration from both Thomas Jefferson's own authored document, the Declaration of Independence, and from the US Constitution. Um, so how shall we address Thomas Jefferson as a figure? So how is Jefferson usually um, slandered, slandered, meaning it's a lie, by the left nowadays? It's part of a larger misrepresentation of the American Revolution. So the kind of revisionism that one sees after the new left and increasingly up to the present is that the American Revolution uh, was a slaveholders revolt, slaveholders revolt, that the American Revolution, this is the 1619 project narrative, the American Revolution was motivated by slave owners trying to protect their property and slaves from the British. And this is what motivated them to declare their independence from the British, is that they were afraid that the British were going to take away their slaves, and so they revolted in order to keep their slaves. This is what is claimed. And of course, Thomas Jefferson, not alone, of course, um, but prominently is a slave owner. He is a slave owner, of course. And so he is uh, cast as a particularly hypocritical figure. In other words, that his declaration that all men are created equal with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was not really meant because it was uh, hypocritical with respect to um, enslaved people of African descent in the Americas and specifically in the newly declared uh, independent United States. That somehow this falsifies uh, that bold declaration in 1776. And I want to unpack that declaration itself a little bit namely life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um, you may or may not uh, be aware that those three among the inalienable rights, so it's not that they're limited to those three by any means, but among the rights, the inalienable rights, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Where those three come from, it's a repetition, but also a revision of John Locke's um, idea of the three most fundamental rights of life, liberty, and property. So Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin decided not to simply repeat John Locke's rights of life, liberty, and property, but to change that property right into the pursuit of happiness. So why did Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson uh, suggest this revision of Locke? As Jefferson put it, and also Franklin, they considered property to be a means towards the ends of freedom and of equality and not an end in itself. In other words, property is, can't be really considered a right because property is just one specific form of a more general right. And so they replaced it with the pursuit of happiness, meaning in their own moment, the pursuit of happiness might be facilitated by the right to property, but in the future, it might not be. In the future, property may not be a vehicle for uh, the elaboration 
and development of our further freedoms. So where did that where did that come from? Why why revise? Why question property per se? Of course, it comes from Jean Jacques Rousseau. It comes from the discourse on the origin of inequality, the second discourse, um, which uh, severely questioned the right to property as a foundation for civilization, um, but also from the Rousseau of uh, the social contract. Um, in other words, the social contract being um, not explicit, but implicit, implicit in our social relations, implicit in the actual practical constitution of the human community and society. Again, of which property needed to be understood not as foundational, but as epiphenomenal. In other words, as a means to an end, not an end in itself. So unlike life and liberty, property is not foundational. Therefore, they replaced it with the pursuit of happiness. So let's um, look more closely at the Declaration of Independence and look at, um, for instance, a paragraph by Jefferson that addresses slavery directly. And this is part of the list of grievances um, against uh, the monarchy, against the king of England, um, George III, um, as part of the, the motivation. Why are the colonies declaring their independence? They have a list of grievances. Here's one of the grievances. And you can find this, by the way, in the suggested readings that I've provided. This is in the, um, I'm going to be reading from the, some quotations from Thomas Jefferson that I've, that I've collected for you guys. So Jefferson says, he has waged, he being the king, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative, his veto, for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this exorable commerce. So it's a very clear condemnation, not merely of George III, of specific policies regarding slavery, but of slavery itself. Slavery itself is condemned. So Thomas Jefferson is himself a slave owner, of course, although mostly he inherited slaves through his wife, through marriage. That's where the slaves came from. And I'm gonna talk about a major figure in the narrative of the life of Thomas Jefferson, namely Sally Hemings, um, with respect to this inheritance that he, this, this legacy, slaves as, his, as Jefferson's legacy that he acquired through marriage to his wife. Um, that slavery itself by Jefferson, among other American revolutionaries, was seen as a not only bad, but actually a terrible, abominable institution that they looked forward to abolishing. Now the question is, how was that abolition of slavery to come about? And that was a question. They assumed, the American revolutionaries assumed, that the institution of slavery would die of its own accord. In other words, they saw it as itself an expression of the old order that they were overthrowing. So you'll notice in this paragraph that Jefferson attributes the institution of slavery to precisely the political order with which they have a grievance and which they are, uh, from which they are declaring independence and which they are therefore over, overthrowing for themselves, namely uh, the British monarchy. They expected slavery 
to die of its own accord, not merely by virtue of throwing off the monarchy, but also by the development of bourgeois society itself, by the development of uh, the bourgeois social relations, the society of labor, the rights of labor, which are of course violated by slavery. That brings us back, by the way, to John Locke. Life, liberty, and property as foundational rights, um, enunciated uh, contemporaneously with the glorious revolution in England, the establishment of the primacy of parliament over the monarchy, the institution of um, a constitutional monarchy rather than the divine right of kings, a constitutional monarchy, life, liberty, and property, Locke understood property itself to be a right based not on possession. It's not a right of first occupant. It's not a right of possession, but it's a right of labor. So Locke said, where do we get the right to property from? First of all, property is not a physical possession, but a social right, according to Locke. And so where does this social right derive from? Does it, does it derive from um, the right of the mighty, the right of the stronger, the right of physical acquisition and possession? No, he said that the right to property derives from labor. So anything with which we've mixed our labor, anything that we've labored upon becomes our property, according to Locke. So specifically, property rights are rights of labor. And of course, slavery is a violation of precisely those rights, the right of labor. It's unfree labor, and therefore a violation of the rights of labor, a fundamental violation of the inalienable rights upon which bourgeois society understands itself to be based. So this is why the American revolutionaries could reasonably foresee the destruction of slavery as an institution, as a function of their revolution. You will also know from subsequent history that slavery is not actually articulated in uh, the US Constitution. In other words, there's no right to slavery, uh, to possessing slaves, to property in human beings enumerated in the US Constitution. The US Constitution was silent on it until the 13th Amendment prohibited it. So the US Constitution was silent on slavery until it was explicitly prohibited. And that silence on slavery is very important because again, it's expected to go away on its own accord. Uh, you could say that the three-fifths compromise implicitly sanctions slavery, but slavery itself is never explicitly sanctioned, is never explicitly justified or established in the US Constitution, nor, nor could it have been, in fact. It could only be explicitly abolished later. <laughs> I have some other quotations here that are not from Jefferson, but that are rather about Jefferson. And they're taken from, um, well, my first quotation uh, from a secondary source is from uh, Ken Burns, a PBS Public Broadcasting Service documentary on Jefferson from 1997 from the Clinton era. Um, and this is an interesting kind of articulation of, again, the historical imagination. And we'll follow it up with um, a Robert Frost poem. Um, it's about the legacy of the American Civil War, but also about the legacy of, of Jefferson, as we'll see. So this is James Cox from the Ken Burns documentary on Thomas Jefferson. He says, I go right back to the equality clause. All men are created equal. It's all men are created equal. I think that's the key one. And that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of happiness, it's difficult to know. It's not quite. He isn't a pleasure seeker. It's not about um, 
the right to pleasure it's on, a, on the principle of hedonism. And yet he knows that freedom is happiness too. That liberty will enable you to pursue happiness. And how grand it is that in a capitalistic country like this, that he did not follow Locke and have life, liberty, and property. And that mystery of the pursuit of happiness suits me just fine. If the equality clause will trouble us a thousand years, as Robert Frost said in the North of Boston poem, The Black Cottage from 1915, if it'll trouble us, the pursuit of happiness will mystify us forever. So if we're troubled by the assertion of equality, the pursuit of happiness will mystify us forever meaning the open-ended character of the pursuit of freedom will mystify us forever, as it rightly should. And he says, I like the trouble, and I like the mystery. I like the trouble of equality, and I like the mystery of the pursuit of happiness. And that suits me just fine about Jefferson. So Jefferson introduces trouble, and he introduces mystery. By the way, this is one of the reasons why um, Jefferson was chosen to write the first draft of the Declaration of Independence by his colleagues, by his comrades um, in the revolution. They thought of Jefferson as a little crazy. They thought of him as a little crazy. And they respected him. They thought he was brilliant, but they thought he was a little crazy. And they thought that, that made him particularly suited to write this document, the Declaration of Independence. In other words, it's a kind of an inspired genius of Jefferson, a kind of inspired madness. That's, that's just the guy we need to write the Declaration of Independence. Because of course the revolution is an act of inspired genius. It's also an act of inspired madness, always. So let's talk about Early 20th century, Robert Frost, writing in 1915, the imagination of the legacy of the American Revolution through the legacy of the American Civil War, the US Civil War, which is, of course, don't listen to any crazy people on the left, the uninspired crazies on the left, was fought to abolish slavery. Let's have no doubt about that, that the Civil War was about slavery. In other words, if there's some doubt over 1776, let there be no doubt about the Civil War. So Robert Frost said, or wrote in 1915, whatever else the Civil War was for, it wasn't just to keep the states together, nor just to free the slaves, though it did both. She, figure in the poem, wouldn't have believed those ends enough to have given outright for them all she gave, her giving somehow touched the principle that all men are created free and equal. And to hear her quaint phrases so removed from the world's view today of all those things. That's a hard mystery of Jefferson's. What did he mean? Of course, the easy way is to decide it simply isn't true. It may not be. I heard a fellow say so. But never mind the Welshman, Jefferson, got it planted, where it will trouble us a thousand years. Each age will have to reconsider it. Each age, each generation will have to reconsider it. And of course, that's the point of this lecture series. That's the point of my lecture today, is that every generation is tasked with considering the trouble and the mystery bequeathed to us the legacy of Thomas Jefferson, the trouble and mystery introduced into history by Thomas Jefferson. Each age will have to reconsider it. It's coming up for reconsideration now. What are the stakes of that reconsideration? How do we understand that reconsideration? In considering Jefferson's legacy, through not only the revolution, but through the US Constitution, a very often quoted letter of Jefferson's from the year of the 
uh, drafting of the U.S. Constitution, 1787. Um, very famous articulation of Jefferson as a revolutionary. So he's writing back from Paris in 1787. This is Jefferson. He says, the people cannot be all and always well informed. The part which is wrong will be discontented in proportion to the importance of the facts they misconceive. If they remain quiet under such misconceptions, it is a lethargy, the forerunner of death to the public liberty. And what country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The remedy is to set them right as to facts, pardon and pacify them. What signify a few lives lost in a century or two? The tree of liberty, this is the famous passage, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. So what he's uh, talking about here is the Shays Rebellion of 1787, um, in which the US military had to be used for the first time to put down a rebellion. And what does that mean? What does it mean that there's a rebellion a major rebellion needing to be put down, an armed rebellion needing to be put down by military force by the central government in the United States in the same year that the U.S. Constitution is drafted and adopted, 1787. And this is Jefferson's answer. Jefferson's answer is, even if they're wrong, we should prefer that they rise up in rebellion than that there be a lethargy and death of the body politic, of um, public liberty, of public liberty. We should rather that people mistakenly, wrongly, indeed he says, take up arms and rebel rather than that they remain quiet. In other words, if people are discontented and they might be wrong in their discontents, but if they're discontented, it's better than, for them to rise up than to be quiet. Few lives lost every century or two. Um, set them to right as to facts, pardon and pacify them. But it's better that they rise up wrongly and under misconceptions than that public liberty and the body politic um, experience lethargy and indeed death. It is its natural manure meaning it's the fertilizer, it's the fertilizer. Um, another uh, point to be made about the U.S. Constitution is that even though uh, we have remained in the United States in the same constitutional republic continuously, uninterruptedly, from 1789, the first year that it's implemented, up until the present, unlike France, for example, which is in the Fifth Republic, and has experienced the restoration of monarchy as well as an empire since its revolution of 1789. The U.S. has been one, one continuous republic since 1787, 1789. Um, but they themselves did not necessarily expect the Constitution to remain in force for 200 and more years. They, uh, in fact, expected rather the opposite that the US constitutional order would be substantially revised, perhaps even through revolution, and not be this kind of permanent uh, order, political order that it has been um, in the meantime. That's important to bear in mind as well. Now, speaking of the constitution in particular, the opposition of the revolution against the constitution. So Jefferson is certainly associated to, with 1776 and the revolution, he's less associated with the Constitution. And yet, of course, he endorsed the Constitution. Um, he's usually seen as an anti-federalist, 
as opposed to the Federalists. So we have the Federalist Papers, um, which explain and justify the Constitution. And Jefferson is seen as an anti-Federalist, but that's actually an anachronism. His um, discontent with um, the presidency of John Adams and uh, with Alexander Hamilton uh, it comes later and is motivated uh, very specifically. So Jefferson entirely endorsed the US Constitution. And so in that respect, he's not an anti-federalist by any means. And specifically he endorsed um, perhaps what is now seen as uh, a problematic aspect of the US Constitution, namely the strong executive, the presidency as a kind of elected monarchy. He endorsed that, he endorsed that Jefferson, even though Jefferson is usually seen as being like um, a kind of popular democratic figure as opposed to the Federalists or more strong central government kind of executive figures, again, in the form of people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. That's actually a false opposition um, that, that Jefferson does not fit into. So he endorsed a strong executive. And uh, by the way, that comes from the results of the English Revolution and both of the uh, Cromwellian Revolution, the English Civil War, but more specifically of the Glorious Revolution, in the Whig conception of the executive, of the executive. Um, in other words, how a constitutional monarchy in the, in the American system, the elected monarchy of the presidency, is actually a guarantor of liberty. A guarantor of liberty against the tyranny of the legislature, so the separation of powers in the US Constitution are actually meant to be a guarantor of freedom. In other words, the three branches of government are meant to check each other to preserve the freedom of society against the tyranny of government. So the government is meant to keep itself in check through the separation of powers and through the antagonism of the various branches. And that means a strong executive is seen as a check upon the tyranny of the legislature so that you would separate lawmaking from the execution of law, the implementation of law, that the executive interprets law and applies it according to its own judgment, as opposed to merely executing the legislative will. That's meant to be a defense of society and of freedom against the tyranny of the law, against the tyranny of the legislature. So Jefferson supported that and supported that. It's very important to keep in mind. Um, and so it's not, as we might think, uh, the kind of opposition of um, democracy versus execu executive authority. No, it's, it's not a simple matter of that. Because of course, there's only one office that's elected by everyone in the United States, and that's the president. That's the only office for whom everyone in the United States votes, the president. It's important. So, of course, the president is democratically elected. Next, I'd like to address Jefferson's sympathy for the Jacobins. And, of course, it's his sympathy for the French Revolution and for the Jacobins in particular. But for the French Revolution more generally, that is actually at the source of his conflicts with John Adams and with Alexander Hamilton later on. So here's another famous letter. It's from 1793. And it's when Jefferson was the Secretary of State under George Washington. And he's writing to the US Ambassador William Short to France. And specifically, Short had um, criticized the Jacobins, and Jefferson is replying to this criticism. He says, the tone of your letters had for some time given me pain on account of the extreme warmth with which they censured the proceedings of the Jacobins of France. In the struggle which was necessary, many guilty persons fell without the forms of trial and with them some innocent. These I deplore as much as anybody, and shall deplore some of them to the day of my death. 
but I deplore them as I should have done had they fallen in battle. It was necessary to use the arm of the people, a machine not quite so blind as balls and bombs, but blind to a certain degree. A few of their cordial friends met at their hands the fate of enemies. But time and truth will rescue and embalm their memories, while their posterity will be enjoying that very liberty for which they would never have hesitated to offer up their lives. The liberty of the whole earth was depending on the issue of the contest, and was ever such a prize won with so little innocent blood. My own af affections have been deeply wounded by some of the martyrs to this cause, but rather than it should have failed, I would have seen half the earth desolated. Were there but an Adam and an Eve left in every country and left free, it would be better than as it now is. So let's, let's consider that. So this could be seen as a kind of revolutionary fervor or kind of revolutionary fanaticism on the part of Jefferson that he's willing to see the whole world desolated and the population reduced to one Adam and one Eve as long as they remain free. It sounds like a kind of a bloodthirsty imagination of you know, he's willing to go to any lengths for freedom the depopulation of the human species through revolutionary violence and war and revolutionary terror as was exercised by the Jacobins as long as one Adam and one Eve remained so that the human race could continue and enjoy the freedom that was achieved through the revolution. Yes, he is committed to this. So who is this Adam and who is this Eve? And this is where I want to come around to the figure that shadows Thomas Jefferson, who seems to embody in some very uncomfortable way the issue of Thomas Jefferson as a slave owner. And that's Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings. Um, who was, as it turns out, the half-sister of Thomas Jefferson's wife, who died during childbirth and left um, Thomas Jefferson a widower. So she came uh, as part of the um, legacy from uh, Jefferson's first wife's uh, family. He inherited the slaves from her family when he married into the family. And Sally Hemings was um, the half-sister. And so what that means is that she was um, the daughter of Thomas Jefferson's wife's father. Um, and evidently this had something to do with the attraction that Jefferson had for Sally Hemings is that uh, she looked a great deal like his wife had looked. Now you will hear, you will hear that Thomas Jefferson, unlike other American revolutionaries, unlike other founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson did not free any of his slaves. Not true. Who did he free? He did free two of his slaves in particular. Sally Hemings and her brother, James Hemings. They were both freed by Jefferson uh, within, you know, obviously within his lifetime. Um, although uh, Sally Hemings remained with him and uh, bore him a number of children, as we know, uh, and could have claimed her freedom at any time, but chose to stay with him and so still occupied the position of his slave legally, formally. However, her brother was formally free, James Hemings. He did, in fact, um, get his freedom upon request from Thomas Jefferson. He requested his freedom from Thomas Jefferson, and he was granted that. But Sally Hemings was also no longer simply Thomas Jefferson's slave, but rather became the mother of his children. And the story of the, um, the Jefferson Hemings um, legacy 
the children uh, is interesting because some of them went on to pass as white. In other words, some of them uh, in subsequent history. So they're all freed. They're all um, free people, the children. Um, but later, uh, in terms of legal status, some of them are classified as black and some of them are classified as white. And, and therefore have differential uh, histories subsequently. But they're all freed. And of course, their freedom begins with the freedom of Sally and, his, and her brother, James. And interestingly, so Jefferson's also known for some notorious remarks, some speculations as to the racial inferiority of Africans in his notes on Virginia. Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine. So the left will occasionally give Thomas Paine as an American revolutionary and as a founding father of sorts. They'll give him a pass. They'll say the founding fathers, the American revolutionaries, problematic, slave owners, not too radical, kind of conservative, but they'll usually make an exception for Thomas Paine. So who is Thomas Paine? Thomas Paine is Jefferson's closest friend in the revolution. Thomas Paine credited Sally Hemings with changing Jefferson's attitude towards people of African descent. In other words, Thomas Paine remarks that, yes, Jefferson wrote these things that he was later embarrassed by in the notes to Virginia, notes on Virginia, in which he speculated and it was kind of open-ended. Maybe the Africans are inferior, maybe they're not. It's impossible to tell in their condition of servitude. You know, can you really see people's potential when they're slaves? But maybe they are inferior, maybe, maybe they're not. Um, but he abandoned that perspective subsequently, according to Thomas Paine, by virtue of his relationship with Sally Hemings. In other words, Sally Hemings, uh, Thomas Paine credited with uh, positively affecting and overcoming Jefferson's um, at least misgivings about equality with regard to people of African descent. Um, and therefore, we would say his racism, his racism was tempered, affected, and according to Thomas Paine, overcome by his relationship with Sally Hemings. Um, you can read um, uh, Annette Gordon Reed has some interesting writings on the Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings relationship that's worth worth uh, worthwhile, very worthwhile. Um, but there's also earlier literature, like I said, this is also documented by uh, Thomas Paine. Um, finally, and I know that I've gone a little bit late on time, I want to talk about um, the Revolution of 1800 why Thomas Jefferson found it necessary to start a political party and to run for election and win election to, um, to overturn the presidency of John Adams when he did in 1800 and why his party was called the Democratic Republican Party. So uh, the basic thought figure here is that the US is a constitutional republic, it's not a democracy. In other words, it's not about um, the direct majoritarian rule of the people, but rather it's about the rule of law. It's a republic, not a democracy. It's a rule of law, not of people. And you'll hear this kind of language, usually voiced by Republicans, but occasionally by Democrats nowadays in mainstream American politics, that the U.S. is a country not of people, but of laws. In other words, it's not a blood and soil polity. The United States does not represent people of a certain descent. It does not even represent um, a certain geographical land. It's not a country of land or of people, but rather it's a country of laws. In other words, it's held together not by common blood, by common ancestry, nor by common territory, but it's held together by ideas, by laws. So it's a constitutional republic, not a democracy, because it's not a rule of people, it's a rule of laws, that idea. Jefferson did not disagree with that. He did not disagree with that. But he still thought that it should be a democratic republic. 
in other words, not a democracy, but a republic, but nonetheless a democratic republic. A republic that still must answer democratically. This has all to do with um, the interpretation of the US Constitution. In other words, once the Constitution was uh, adopted and implemented, um, George Washington was the first president of the new US Constitutional Republic and served for two terms. And there was a lot of struggle within uh, the Washington era over the interpretation of the Constitution in practice. And Jefferson was, was a protagonist in that struggle, but he felt that the John Adams presidency uh, really botched it, really violated the meaning, the purpose, in practice, of the US Constitution, and therefore represented a betrayal of the revolution. So he understood um, John Adams and Alexander Hamilton to have betrayed the 1776 revolution, and therefore betrayed the spirit, if not the letter, but the spirit of the US Constitution, adopted in 1787 and implemented in 1789. And so he felt that he needed to launch a revolution. However, through the election of 1800. So the election of 1800 is understood subsequently, but also in the moment as the revolution of 1800. The election of 1800 is called the revolution of 1800. And that's not a mere uh, figure of speech, but it's meant very literally um, both by historians and by the protagonists, and specifically by Thomas Jefferson, and by his Democratic Republican Party. So you needed um, a new party to lead uh, a political revolution, at least, in order to restore the spirit of the original American Revolution and the constitutional order that emerged from that revolution in, in the U.S. Constitution. Um, and so this is the first organized political party in U.S. history, the Democratic Republican Party. Now, Jefferson had some experience with that from the 1776 revolution, and that's why I'm now going to go back to consider Jefferson's role in another respect. He not only was the author of the Declaration of Independence, but he's also an organizer of the Revolutionary Party of the original 1776 revolution, and that's the party called itself the Committees of Correspondence. They were the Committees of Correspondence. And they were what maybe latter-day wannabe Leninists or kind of wannabe communist Bolsheviks. They were institutions of dual power in the American Revolution. Namely, the Committees of Correspondence were organized independently of and as alternatives to the uh, colonial governments of the, of the British colonies. And Jefferson is one of the founders of the Committees of Correspondence, one of the main organizers of the Committees of Correspondence prior to the Revolution of 1776. And it's the Committees of Correspondence that constitute um, the Continental Congress that declares independence and, and organizes the revolution, commissions Washington to lead the military forces to defeat the British, et cetera, um, to prosecute the revolution. And it's, he's, He's reliving his youth in organizing the Democratic Republican Party and leading it to victory in the election of 1800. Again, motivated by what he considers the misinterpretation, the abuse, and the betrayal of the U.S. Constitution as embodying the spirit of the American Revolution. And this is, of course, contemporaneous. The uh, John Adams administration is contemporaneous with um, the post-Jacobin period of the French Revolution. And uh, international politics, geopolitics, weighs very heavily on this era. Uh, John Adams is, is known uh, infamously, has some notoriety for the Alien and Sedition Acts uh, that he promoted um, under his administration. And those were directed against sympathizers of the French Revolution. In other words, they're the domestic US political expression of British-aligned counter-revolution 
against the French Revolution on an international scale. And of course, Jefferson is quite opposed to these, to this kind of a move. And so Adams and Hamilton um, wanted to align with the British against the French. The British as the organizers of the world counter-revolution against the French Revolution in this period. Jefferson, rather, was on the side of the French. Even though he had his misgivings about the course of the French Revolution after the fall of the Jacobins. Nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, in terms of the larger geopolitical conflict, the unfolding revolution coming out of France after 1789, Jefferson's on the side of the revolution and Adams and Hamilton are on the side of the counter-revolution. They're on the side of the British who are organizing the global counter-revolution against the French Revolution. Um, and that informs, by the way, other events of uh, Jefferson's own administration. I won't be able to get into it in detail because I've already gone over time, but uh, you'll look at one of the readings that I've um, recommended is uh, Thomas Paine wrote a series of letters that both justified and explained and promoted the Jeffersonian Revolution between 1802 Two and 1805, and then some other letters uh, subsequent that I didn't include up to 1807. There were a series of, of reflections on the American Republic um, in which he talks about the relationship of the American and French Revolution, of the United States and Britain, and the geopolitical strife of the era, and of the, again, the meaning of the U.S. constitutional order and the stakes of Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. So Payne, you know, again, just as Jefferson organized the Democratic Republican Party the way that he had organized the committees of correspondence, Payne, just as he had justified the American Revolution in 1776, comes back into the public sphere in, uh, under uh, the Jefferson administration to justify the Jeffersonian Revolution of 1800 in a series of letters on the American Republic directed to the address to the citizens of, of, the, of the United States. Um, a major event of Jefferson's administration are the wars with the so-called Barbary Coast Pirates. It was the first um, overseas war and the, the war that took place uh, under the Jefferson administration. And of course, the wars against, uh, the, the, or the war against the Barbary Coast Pirates um, were bound up with uh, the geopolitical global turmoil of the struggle of the French Revolution, specifically against the British as the organizers of counter-revolution at a global scale. So we're bound up with that. Um, and so Jefferson pursues those, uh, that, that conflict as part of this broader um, conflict. And Beyond, I'll just make mention of this quickly, beyond uh, Jefferson's own administration, the so-called War of 1812 between the British and the Americans is part of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, usually forgotten in American history. It's part of the Napoleonic Wars. In other words, why are the British and the Americans at war in 1812? Because the Americans are aligned with the French against the British. That's, that's what that war is about. And so again, um, in terms of the legacy of Jefferson, the subsequent administration, right, there is an alignment towards the French Revolution against the British, and that ultimately uh, results in the War of 1812, um, part of the Napoleonic Wars taking place at that time. Um, leading towards the end of Jefferson's life, and it's interesting that both he and his major antagonist, John Adams, both died on the 50th anniversary, like literally on the day of the 50th anniversary of the 1776 Declaration of Independence in 1826. They died within hours of each other. So Jefferson lived just long enough to see the legacy of the American Revolution secured in a certain sense, 50 year anniversary. The year before, the year before, um, 
we have a letter by uh, Jefferson that articulates um, his, his regrets as a revolutionary, his regrets as a revolutionary, but looking ahead to how the struggle might continue. And this is a letter to Frances Wright in 1825. And she is a utopian socialist. She's a communist. And he makes mention of other utopian socialists and communists with regard to the abolition of slavery. So he says, I do not permit myself to take part in any new enterprises, even for bettering the condition of man, not even in the great one, which is the subject of your letter, the abolition of slavery, and which has been through life that of my greatest anxieties. The march of events has not been such as to render its completion practicable within the limits of time allotted to me. And I leave its accomplishment as the work of another generation. And I am cheered when I see that on which it is dissolved, devolved, taking it up with so much goodwill and such mind engaged in its encouragement. The abolition of the evil is not impossible. It ought never, therefore, to be despaired of. Every plan should be adopted, every experiment tried, which may do something towards the ultimate object. That which you propose is worthy of trial. It has succeeded with certain portions of our white brethren under the care of the Christian communist, George Rapp, and the utopian socialist, Robert Owen. And why may, may it not succeed with the man of color? So Frances Wright, she's an abolitionist, and basically she um, buys the freedom of slaves and then organizes, you know, it's very much in, in the keeping of the spirit of the times in the 1820s, utopian socialist communities from freed slaves. And Jefferson, and she writes to him and says, you know, we'd love your endorsement, we'd love your, your thoughts on this. And he writes back and says, you know what, I'm out of public life, but I have been watching these things, and of course, I completely support your efforts. So there we have, again, the great American revolutionary, early socialism, the task of abolitionism, all coming together in the final year of Jefferson's life. That, of course, is the legacy of the American Revolution that Jefferson represented. And later, not only the next revolutionary event in American history, the U.S. Civil War, or the name and spirit of Jefferson through the Republican Party, which was the resuscitation of Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party, and with which Abraham Lincoln directly associated his struggle in the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, but also later in uh, American socialism, Eugene Debs famously said that the legacy of Jefferson belongs not to either the Democrat or Republican parties, not to capitalism, but to the struggle for socialism. The spirit, memory, and legacy of Jefferson was to be continued not through American capitalism and capitalist politics, but rather through socialism, specifically socialist revolution. Okay, so let's open it up for questions. Okay, great, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, so for Q&A, uh, you can write your questions into the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand uh, to speak. Um, we'll try to get through as many as we can before we wrap up at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so first, I saw that Richard, your hand has been up. Um, so why don't we unmute Richard? And you can go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, so you spoke a lot about, can you hear me? Yes. OK. So we discussed the uh, question of the relationship between the American and French revolutions and Jefferson's role. So um, I wanted to actually read a passage from The Age of Democratic Revolution, and I wanted to have your response to it. It's about a By paragraph. Who? 
uh, R. R. Palmer's Age of Democratic Revolution. And when is it written? It's a pretty new leftist book. It's a classic description of the history, 1760 to 1800. So it's part of the uh, New Deal progressive era historiography. Uh, no, it's actually post-war. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's New Deal progressivism. I don't yeah. know. But he's a liberal. Uh -huh. um, in the age of democratic revolution, R. R. Palmer writes, Hamilton, who loathed the Frank Revolution, was more of a revolutionary than Jefferson, both in temperament and in the policies that he espoused. He was more impatient of the compromises on which the federal constitution rested. He wanted to make over the country, and he would li have liked, if he could, to abolish the states and replace them with small departements created by the national government, as in the French and other revolutionary republics in Europe. Jefferson, who sympathized with the French Revolution, was actually a good deal of a moderate, both in personality and in his ideas of what should be done. He spoke for a kind of liberty and equality that had long existed in America and did not have to be fought for as in Europe, a liberty that meant freedom from government and an equality of the kind that obtained among yeoman farmers, a way of life that had been threatened by British policy before 1775, and was threatened by Hamiltonian policy after 1790, in each case with the support of American, quote, aristocrats, unquote, or persons aspiring to become such. Because of their different views of the need of change, it was Hamilton who was the unitarist and Jefferson the federalist, both in quotation marks, in the sense then current in Europe, whereas we have seen the radical Democrats were unitarists and the moderates were inclined to the decentralization of power. The unitarist and revolutionary Hamilton was certainly no Jacobin, but he was the nearest that the United States ever produced to a Bonaparte. The kinds of people who in the United States favored the French Revolution were not the same as in Europe. There was a curious reversal or transposition. In Europe, on the whole, those who favored the French Revolution were middle-class people living in towns, including a good many bankers and businessmen, especially those interested in the newer forms of economic enterprise and development. Among the rural population on the continent, it was the landowners and property owning farmers living nearest to the cities, most involved in a market economy and enjoying the best communications with the outside world, who were the most receptive to the revolutionary ideas. In America, the opposite was more nearly true. The business and mercantile community and the farmers who lived nearest to the towns or along the rivers and arteries of traffic and communication were generally Federalist and they became anti-French and anti-Republican. The same inversion holds for the counter-revolution, which in Europe was essentially agrarian. It drew its strength from the landed aristocracy and from peasants who were politically apathetic or looked upon cities as the abode of their enemies. In the United States, the Virginia gentry and farmers farthest from towns along the frontier from Vermont through Western Pennsylvania to Kentucky were strongly Jeffersonian, Republican, and anti-British and partisan to the French Revolution. It's almost finished. In Europe, the revolutionary movement, though it carried aristocratic liberalism and bavuvist communism at its fringes, was most especially a middle-class or bourgeois affair aimed at the reconstruction of an old order and at the overthrow of aristocracies, nobilities, patriciates and other privileged classes. It is hard to see how Jefferson, who so much disliked cities with their moneyed men and their mobs, could have been so sympathetic to the French Revolution had he seen it in an altogether realistic light. The same is true of American Democrats generally, but Hamilton and the Federalists were, if anything, even more mistaken. They imagined men like themselves in Europe were as hostile to the revolution as they were, or rather in their own self-definition, they failed to identify with the European urban middle classes, which they really resembled and preferred to associate themselves with the British and European aristocracies, which they hardly resembled at all. So do you agree with any of that? None of that? Some no, of that? I completely reject everything there. And I think that it is um, a very clear transposition of FDR New Deal Democratic Party politics onto the past. That's what it is. I mean, in other words, um, Hamilton is a Bonapartist, and so this is a justification for a strong central government that, um, on a democratic basis, of cities. I mean, that's the Democratic Party, that's FDR, right? And it also is putting its finger on 
the weak part of the FDR New Deal coalition, namely the, um, the union of the urban machine rackets of the Democrats with the Dixiecrats of the South, right? So it's, it's you know, very clearly, very clearly an intervention in the politics of its own time and a recasting of history along those lines. And so, of course, Hamilton looks like- But the Democratic Party, the, Democrat, like the Democratic Party under FDR was very pro Jefferson. Jefferson was the Jefferson Monument was inaugurated when FDR was president. Yeah, the, that's hardly the point. In other words, the point is how does one understand the American political system? And how so, does one so how? But how do you understand the question about the revolution and counter revolution and identification and counter identification? I think it's just a botch of everything. I mean, that R. R. Palmer is a total botch of everything. It it completely misconstrues everything, right? It. It basically says, you know, it's like a paradox. It's a paradox that the American Revolution is the inverse of the French Revolution. But he, the the inverse. he says it's a he says it's a misidentification of the partisans. Well, within, the, says, within the revolution, who the radicals are. He doesn't say that either of the radicals. He actually considers them, like both in a sense, radicals and both moderates. Yeah, I think it's completely wrong. I think it's top to bottom. Everything is wrong about that. Completely. It also. Um, you know, so, do you it, disagree with James's point in the last lecture about the question about the both Hamilton and Adams also being radicals? Or how do you see that evolution? Yes, I disagree. I do. I disagree. Okay. Meaning, um, it's clear that uh, Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson are the radicals in the American Revolution and have to struggle and overthrow Adams and Hamilton. Like very deliberately, they have to come together, overthrow and justify their overthrowing of Adams and Hamilton in the name of the revolution and in the name of the revolutionary spirit of the constitution. All right, no one's gonna argue that Thomas Paine is on the side of the landed gentry or the slave owners Right. So what do we make of the fact that Thomas, that Thomas Paine is a fervent propagandist for the Jeffersonian Revolution in 1800? And fervent opponent. He says that John Adams, he says, well, we always thought that he was not really a revolutionary in his letters of 1802 to 1805. He says, those of us who participated in the revolution always had our suspicions of John Adams. And unfortunately, they were proven in the presidency. And we always had our suspicions of Hamilton and those were proven in, in Hamilton's role and the policies he, he advocated for. So I think that this is just total bullshit and also 20th century distortion. In other words, it's really an elision of progressivism, progressive capitalism with a bourgeois revolution. So you can't interpret the bourgeois revolution according to the categories of progressive capitalism won't make sense. It will never make sense that way. Hey, um, sorry to sorry to cut Go in. Um, so Richard, if you had something really quick you wanted to respond to Chris, or maybe we can just a couple of other people have their hands up as well. So I just want to go, Go ahead one side. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to unmute um, Greg, who has his hand up. And Greg, I saw you posted um, a couple of questions in the, in the Q&A box as well, but you can just. Oh. Okay, I was hoping for the question. Um, hold on one second. Uh, probably the most important question I have uh, is actually the fourth question. Although the French Revolution had its problems, certainly, and certainly was incomplete, nevertheless, it seemed much more revolutionary uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, who is the American Revolution, quote unquote, uh, version of uh, Toussaint Leva. Who? Toussaint well, of course. Right. So you know that, um, of course, there are many black participants in the American Revolution. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and of course, the Haitian Revolution is not quite the same as the French Revolution. Right? Um, perhaps. I, I'm sorry. Please. Go ahead. So. Um, again, 
I would say what you're trying to do there is to say that the American revolutionaries were not really revolutionaries. And the reason is that none of the founding fathers were black. Is that the reason? It's not. Uh, I, I would you... say Thomas Jefferson is America's Toussaint Louverture. Okay. Period. Okay. Right? Like I wouldn't racialize it at all. Um, you know, because there were more radical figures in the Haitian Revolution, there were more moderate figures in the Haitian Revolution, right? Like, you know, kind of get into that. In other words, is, is Toussaint Louverture a Jacobin? Is he a Napoleon style figure? Like, where would, you know, is he kind of a Robespierre? Is he a Napoleon Bonaparte? He's kind of a mixture of both. And again, uh, what one is going to find in the American context if you try to read the American Revolution through the lens of the French Revolution, I think that there will be some problems. Um, and, you know, I don't think that Jefferson was fooling himself or fooling anyone else in being the passionate defender of the Jacobins. Like he's the unabashed, passionate defender of the Jacobins, who's just very, has, actually, he does not like Napoleon Bonaparte. He does not like the Thermidorian reaction. He deals with Napoleon Bonaparte. So one of the things that Jefferson does do is he helps fund the Napoleonic Wars against the British through the Louisiana Purchase. Oof. So he, he, gives the, uh, he gives Napoleon a hell of a lot of money, which is, of course, a way of supporting him against the British. Uh, That's for, real. That's material assistance to the French Revolution in terms of the global geopolitical revolution. Uh, nevertheless, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Greg, I'm going to let you ask a follow up question or maybe respond and then we'll go to the next question. This is, this is actually a question uh, that was already posed. I'm just trying to find it. Um, hold on one second. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, you speak of Jefferson endorsing revolution, yet also talking talk about supporting the Constitution. How do you justify that in being counter-revolution? Moreover, what do you view as the Jeffersonian Louisiana Purchase? Mm. That's it. It's okay. All. Well, um... Wait, what's the first first part of the question? Because the Louisiana Purchase is obviously a complicated one, but uh, the first part of the question again was? Yeah. It was, um, so how do you justify, so you speak of Jefferson endorsing revolution. You also talk about him supporting the Constitution. How do you justify in that it be counter-revolution? What do you view, and how do you view the Louisiana Purchase? Okay, so I still don't quite get it, meaning I don't think that the U.S. Constitution is counter-revolutionary. I don't think it's the American Thermidor. I simply disagree with that. I think it's the, you know, it's the result, it's the fruition, it's the completion of the American Revolution, not its betrayal. And again, looking at it from Jefferson's perspective, that's the way he considered it. And of course, again, he's not an anti-federalist. So again, this R.R. Palmer thing, you know, that Richard brought up is, is incorrect, um, meaning uh, Jefferson's a full supporter of the U.S. Constitution, and in that sense, he's, he's a federalist, right? But, but then the question is, in practice, there were problems that emerged in the Washington administration. And again, there was a lot of struggle within the Washington administration over, in practice, what does the U.S. constitutional political order mean? How should it play out? And Jefferson and Payne thought that the subsequent administration, John Adams, betrayed the meaning and spirit of the U.S. Constitution as the result and completion of the American Revolution. And again, it has to do with the role of government, but also specific policies and the implications of those policies. So we're, we're familiar with this in terms of uh, like finance capital, banking, the relationship between the newly independent United States and the British, um, and, and, you know, various policies, uh, either engendering a, a more kind of urban and what we would now consider to be an industrial economy versus, right, and so the, the um, Louisiana Purchase in that respect 
is uh, seen by Jefferson as an ex as an extension, like, in other words, to, to take over from French colonial possession by the United States, uh, means to extend the American Republic. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and so, uh, you know, of course, it's, it's about um, bourgeois society. It's about um, expanding the realm of uh, production. And of course, a lot of production is still agrarian production. Um, and again, it's, you know, what, what was raised earlier, the yeoman farmer idea, um, I would say that that, of course, is the vision, not the expansion of slavery and the expansion of the plantation economy, um, which unfortunately does follow. It should also be pointed out, by the way, just to underscore the point, that um, you know, in the last years of his life, Jefferson considered the rise of Andrew Jackson and Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party as a, really a source of despair. He was like, no, this is not the way it should go. And you know, so he, he, he talks about how we of the revolutionary generation like assumed, you know, the further development and flowering of freedom and, and yet Andrew Jackson shows that we actually have reason to despair of that, right? So Jackson, in terms of being um, an advocate for the expansion of slavery, as well as Jackson in terms of his policy towards Native Americans is seen very explicitly by Jefferson in the last years of his life as an utter and complete betrayal of the spirit of 1776 and how Jefferson tried to steer it uh, through his administration in the early 19th century. And again, the Democratic Party is not Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party, it's not. It's a split. Okay. Um, for our next question, we are going to go over to Pam. Um, so if we can unmute Pam. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so actually, I think that I wanted to pick up on a common point that James and you are making, which I think in your response to Richard, things may have gotten a bit lost. Your emphasis that Jefferson is a federalist, right? That there's an agreement here about the Constitution of, of, of the Republic. And that in so far as that's the case, as James said in his lecture, Hamilton and Jefferson are bound to this project of the creation of the Republic. And the problems, the division that Hamilton and Jefferson are part of later as a result of both Washington's presidency as well as Adams' presidency um, are things that come up as a result of the success of the revolution and the expansion of bourgeois relations. That, that is to say, the question of finance capital, of the banks, of growing cities, of the free exchange of labor, of small property owners, and the extension of territory brings up a whole new set of problems that couldn't have been foreseen from the standpoint of 1776. Nonetheless, what you've presented as the fundamental division here is the issue of the French Revolution. But I wonder if you can, for the sake of, since you're, since you're taking a tack of a sort of, how does this history get recalled through the 20th century? How is it that in the 20th century, the communists, and specifically the communist party, um, may have done a disservice to what you're emphasizing to some respect, James also emphasized, as a common project that united Hamilton and Jefferson for the emphasis on the division between the two. So I guess I have two questions. One, like what was that emphasis about for the Communist Party? Like why is it that it's Jefferson and not Hamilton, right? Like all the way, Jefferson and not Hamilton? That's one question. And two, like what is lost Given, given your lecture and the emphasis that Jefferson is a federalist, what is lost through that legacy of the Communist Party on Jefferson? That's it. Okay, so obviously there's a problem, and this is what I at least flagged, um, and it's actually a complex problem, and it's something that I, I will address in a subsequent lecture on the Gilded Age. So 
some of us has to wait for the Gilded Age. And that's simply the difference between a bourgeois revolution like the American Revolution and capitalism. And you can't really square them. So, of course, um, in the FDR New Deal era, the Communist Party USA did try to square these um, historically, tried to harmonize progressive liberal capitalism with uh, bourgeois revolution. Uh, so to, to reconcile bourgeois society and capitalism, right, that's the issue. So I would say that um, it's not true that Hamilton is a kind of capitalist avant la lettre, like I wouldn't put it that way. Um, I would rather say that and again, it gets to the issue of like, who's radical, who's conservative, who's moderate. I think that um, those terms, when projected back from capitalism, falsify uh, the bourgeois revolution. In other words, uh, I think it came up, the panel that we had in New York at Columbia University that I spoke on, Norman Markowitz, who is a member of the CPUSA, he said, again, there's a kind of a paradox, a paradox in that Jefferson is the more radical, the more democratic, the more revolutionary, but Hamilton is actually the advocate of capitalism, and so therefore could be seen as radical and revolutionary in another way. In other words, that, that the radicalism and revolutionary character of Jefferson has a kind of backward-looking quality, whereas Hamilton's pro-capitalism has a forward-looking quality. And so the paradox being that even though Hamilton is the figure of the right, he's also the figure of the progressive future of capitalism. Right, so I feel like Markowitz like really put his finger on our panel in New York back in February, put his finger on the issue, which is to say, how do we understand capitalism? Capitalism should not be understood as progressive in terms of freedom, right, that the story of progress and consciousness of human freedom, to use a, a phrase from Hegel, capitalism should not be considered that. Capitalism rather should be considered, from a Marxist perspective, as the crisis of progress and freedom. So progressive capitalism is a kind of contradiction in terms, meaning progressive capitalism is the attempt to keep capitalism going against its own crisis. It's the attempt to save capitalism from itself, right? That's FDR New Dealism. It's the attempt to save capitalism from itself. But that's not really progressive in the sense of the progress of freedom. And that's why it's important for us to notice where Jefferson's sympathies lie towards the end of his life, that his sympathies lie with the utopian socialists and the Christian communists and the abolitionists. And the fact that those, of course, all come together. In other words, utopian socialists and Christian communists and abolitionists, that's all the same scene. That's all the same milieu. As opposed to emerging capitalist politics in the United States, and that's Andrew Jackson. So Andrew Jackson, Jacksonian democracy is the emergence of specifically capitalist politics, which Jefferson recognizes as inimical to the spirit of the revolution. So the way that capitalist politics has a popular base, Jacksonian democracy. You're not answering my question. Um, I, was, I was asking you about- Hamilton and Jefferson. Jefferson and Hamilton by the communist in the 20th century. Well, that's, what I'm, that's exactly what I'm addressing. In other words, I'm okay. addressing the fact that the communists try to harmonize a kind of FDR New Deal progressive liberalism with the bourgeois revolution, right? And in so doing, they have to cast things in a particular way. And Hamilton would represent the Communist Party of the 1930s, Wall Street, right? So who are FDR's enemies? Wall Street. And who, who's Wall Street the offspring of? Hamilton. So what do they turn, my question specifically. You mean you realize Jefferson. it's that simple, right? So Jefferson for the Communist Party then is. Democracy. Democracy against Wall Street. 
Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that of course, the democracy that FDR represents is not the democracy that um, Jefferson represents. Democratic republicanism of Jefferson is not the same as FDR's New Deal coalition. And that's what the so my, my second question was about what was lost in terms of the emphasis that you've given to Jefferson as being a federalist and in the same way that James Vaughn's lecture last week was emphasizing the common project between Hamilton and Jefferson, right? Not through the perspective of capitalism, but rather through the perspective of the bourgeois revolution. Um. I'm still not sure exactly uh, when you say what was lost, you mean lost in the historical memory or lost in practice? If the Communist Party becomes the carrier of Jeffersonian thinking, supposedly for the socialists, and then what you're saying is that they're just an extension of progressive capitalism, of FDRism, what is lost of the legacy of the American Revolution through the capitalists? Meaning you're, you're really harping on the fact that progressive capitalists, progressive historians lose something, right? They're, they're missing out. They allied things and confuse things and that we're obscured fundamentally from the standpoint of the present by this history through FDR, through the renaming of the Jackson Day dinners to the Jackson Jefferson dinners, and the Communist Party are taking their cues essentially as a result of their political strategic perspective on the New Deal and the Popular Front, that they're just taking their cues and they're turning Jefferson in a quote unquote Democrat. So, capital what's D Democrat, lost? right? Right. So, what's lost is I would say that Jefferson belongs more to anarchism than to progressive liberalism. In other words, what's lost is socialism. So, the American Communist Party, the CPUSA in the 1930s, they might claim Jefferson. The Socialist Party, right, the Norman Thomas Socialist Party, the remnant of the Socialist Party from which the Communist Party had split, would also claim Jefferson, right? And the Norman Thomas Socialist Party condemned the New Deal as fascist. They condemned it as Bonapartism, right? I think that for the CPUSA, Bonapartism is good if you have a progressive in office like FDR, but if you don't, then suddenly it's bad, right? So a Republican president would be a fascist, but a Democrat president is progressive. They've been saying that for a long time, right? That's, uh, and not only the communists and the left, but also um, I always like to point out um, Harry S. Truman called his opponent in 1948 a fascist. And how was he a fascist? Because he represented Wall Street against the New Deal. Right, so again, there's a lot that's kind of like twisted in this, and it's a problem, especially if one tries to peg it to sociology. Right, if one tries to say, well, what are the progressive parts of the economy versus the conservative parts of the economy, or something like that, like R.R. Palmer tries to do. He tries to cast the colonies, colonial America, in the revolution, in, in becoming an independent country, tries to try to differentiate what are the progressive versus the conservative parts of the colonies or something like that. And again, I think that Norman Markowitz on our recent panel in New York in February was actually very good at focusing that question in terms of what promotes capitalism and, and seeing the contradiction there. The what promotes capitalism is actually inimical to the spirit of the bourgeois revolution to the democratic spirit of the bourgeois revolution. And so he says, you know, it's a paradox because on the one hand, Jefferson is the more radical, the more revolutionary. On the other hand, it's Hamilton who's promoting capitalism. And as, as we know, capitalism is progressive. And what I would say is capitalism is not progressive. In other words, short of achieving socialism, capitalism is a regression of bourgeois society. It's a decadence of bourgeois society. And of course, it's capitalism that gives slavery its second lease on life. In other words, Jefferson is blamed for slavery where it's capitalism that is bringing slavery back in the 19th century. So what prevented slavery from dying a natural death? Capitalism. In other words, precisely Hamiltonian capitalism is what gives it's the way the newly independent United States relates to global capitalism, British industry, that America is a client state of British industry, 
And that's what gives slavery its second lease on life. That's exactly the point, right? So again, it's kind of like, oh, well, the idea is, well, Jefferson's vision for America couldn't work because of capitalism. And therefore, when looked at from that standpoint, suddenly, even though he's the more radical, the more revolutionary, it looks like actually it's Hamilton who's more progressive. Because unlike Jefferson, Hamilton, you know, uh, kind of uh, augurs capitalism, right? So it seems like Jefferson is just in this kind of utopian bourgeois like realm of small, small scale production bourgeois society. But as we know, the way of the future belongs to capitalism and Hamilton represents that, whereas Jefferson is this sort of quaint kind of stuck in the 18th century kind of figure. And I feel like, well, yes, if you assume that capitalism is progressive, then you're gonna be faced with this conundrum. But if you recognize that capitalism is a regression of society, then that conundrum disappears. And one recognizes that Jefferson's on the side of freedom against capitalism, against capitalism, becoming capitalism. Okay, great. Um, take our next question from James, who our audience members will hear from our last two lectures. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Chris, thanks for the talk. Um, you, you addressed this uh, previously. Uh, I was going to ask you when you were talking about the expectation that they had sent slavery on the road to extinction to um, further elaborate what, why that was a legitimate prognostication in the late 18th century and, and was undermined. So in some sense, you've already addressed that question, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to sort of talk, expound upon it further. And also one other thing I wanted to say was, and this is more of a comment, that just as we would reject, or sorry, just as I believe that those in the Marxist tradition should reject the kind of, um, uh, 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 Dem Democrat, Walsh, the Democrat FDR, really beginning even in the later 19th century kind of recharacterization of Hamilton, we could equally reject the Hamilton they now offer to us through the musical and whatnot. That is to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that the party that created this figure of Jefferson that your lecture is very much designed to counter, you know, also created this negative image of Hamilton, although they've now flipped it over and made mm -hmm. it up positive image, but I mean that just at the level of a comment. Okay, so why was slavery on the road to extinction? Because it's inimical to the rights of man, right? So in other words, once you have a social and political order based on the freedom of labor, slavery is obviously inimical to that. Oh, no, sorry, I'm not Sorry, I'm not asking that. That that's clear. Uh, I'm asking. But that's I, why they're. That's why they had the expectation. In other words, they thought yes. that, um, you know, that, you know, from a from a legal juridical standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a practical social standpoint. Um, you know, in other words, the assumption would simply be, and of course, this bears out in Jefferson's own life, namely that he had slaves. James and Sally Hemings, who approached him and said, we want our freedom, right? And so, uh, you know, and which of the slaves were they? They're the ones who were doing not work in the fields, but work in uh, the shops, right? They're, they're the artisanal, right? So they're the ones who are engaged in, in what we would now recognize as labor. Right. And so, you know, he has the personal experience of people claiming their rights. And he thought that is just going to happen. Right. Now, uh, a lot can also be said with regard to the course of the American Revolution itself. Namely, slavery was abolished in the northern colonies. Right. Um, and again, it was tolerated in the southern colonies only because the southern colonies completely depended upon this um, first of all on the plantation economy export economy um, and also slavery you know as it as it um, expanded out of that core 
meaning a lot of slave owners only owned a few slaves. And so it's this kind of patriarchal system that's more or less untenable. Meaning, uh, for instance, I'll, I'll just point this out as a kind of an obvious thing in terms of concrete everyday life. So owning a slave when you don't own a plantation might mean that your slave goes to work for someone else and you collect their wages. That happened, right? That's like a real like life thing is that in a bourgeois society, what owning a slave means, it might be like you, you own a worker who then is employed by someone else and instead of the worker being paid, the owner is paid and then the owner pays for the upkeep of the slave. That, that happened, right? And insofar as that seems like the wave of the future, it's just obvious that it, at a certain point, the slave is going to deal directly with the employer and not through his owner, right? Yes, no? Yes, I guess, yeah. You know, yeah, to, yeah. I mean, if, you know, we need to know the social history of slavery. Right, no, and I think it's worth emphasizing that we often have this image of slavery as purely plantation and purely in the South, but it's throughout the entire colonies and mm -hmm. that it's exactly eliminated that you get you know, that it is massively eliminated mid-Atlantic and New England as a result. It's patriarchal of too, we should point out. In other words, the same way that a woman might go to work at the permission of her husband or her father, and that the husband or the father gets paid for the work that the woman does for an employer, that also happened. And the way children would be employed, and the, the labor of the child would be paid for by the employer to the, to the family, to the father. Right, it's like that kind of a system, yes? And so the same way in which bourgeois society um, spontaneously generates demands for equality and actual juridical relations of equality in other spheres, it does so with slavery as well, right? And so it, it you know, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, in terms of everyday life and in terms of how slavery passed in the North, why, why and how it was so facilitated in its passing in the North, it's important to bear in mind. Right. Now, of I, course, can yeah. I, just, I just thought implicit in your talk and implicit mm -hmm. in the series and, and made explicit is not the idea that Oh, they, the, the, the idea that people sometimes have that they declared, right, freedom and equality of all people and, yes. and ignored slavery. Actually, yes. they took very concrete, deliberate steps to set it up on the road to extinction. Yes. And, and I thought that that's what you were, that was so important in your comment that Abraham Lincoln is refounding the Democratic Republican Party because mm -hmm. it's not clear that slavery is any longer on the road to extinction and quite fact the opposite. Mm-hmm. Although it's obviously generating spontaneous conflict. In other words, it's not because of the ideas of abolitionists that slavery is a problem in the United States leading to the Civil War. Right? In other words, it's not the sentiments of some people who are outraged by slavery that leads to the Civil War. That's not how it happens. What happens is that the institution of slavery comes into objective conflict with the society of productive labor. Yes, thank you. And it's the competition, for example, of free laborers versus slave owners in the Western states, right? Free so, soil, free labor. Yeah, free soil, free labor. Um, and that's not just farmers, right? That's also urban laborers. Right, because again, slavery is also a form of urban labor. It's not only a form of agrarian labor, it's a form of urban labor as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks, James. Um, I'm just going to quickly, uh, Pam, who asked Chris a question before, had a quick comment, so I was just going to read her comment. The mm -hmm. Ordinance of 1784 proposition by Jefferson aimed to prohibit slavery in uh, expansion of slavery into the territories. Southerners defeated the original proposal. His 1787 ordinance prohibited slavery in the Northwest Territory, and it's worth emphasizing Jefferson's role here um, as a radical. And we just came up on the hour, but maybe Chris, um, if we can sneak in one more question from the audience. Um, 
Henning had a quick question. Does Jefferson's critique of slavery uh, differ in any way from Adam Smith? And that'll be our last question. Does it differ in any way from Adam Smith? Um, well, I would say that in fact, they um, harmonize quite well. So I would say that both Adam Smith and Thomas Jefferson's animus towards slavery is based on a kind of Lockean notion of bourgeois society and freedom and the rights therein. Um, however, of course, Adam Smith makes a fairly complex argument against slavery. So we might, say, we might be tempted to think that Adam Smith is just an economist and he sees slavery as inefficient at an economic level. But of course, Adam Smith was not an economist. He's a moral philosopher, right? He understands uh, production, wealth, and the social relations of production and of wealth as a moral issue. And therefore it's inseparable. The, the moral problem of slavery is inseparable from the economic question of slavery. And I think that that's true for Jefferson as well. And Jefferson, of course, is not writing political economy, he can't be cast as any kind of economist. Um, but he certainly, you know, has a view with regard to the true moral foundations of society. And so, you know, again, it's impossible to separate the way it would now appear. In other words, it would appear now that people have to sacrifice their material economic interests in favor of their moral interests. In other words, that, for instance, white people benefit from racism materially, economically, and so therefore they have to sacrifice that material economic interest in favor of a kind of moral anti-racism. Right? That's, you know, if we go out on the street, if I were to go interview people on the street, that's the idea that people would have, is that white people have benefited from anti-black racism, and therefore they have to give up that benefit from anti-black racism on a moral, they have to have a moral awakening. And of course that's simply not true. In other words, um, white workers have been materially economically harmed by uh, anti-black racism, meaning anti-black racism is a way of rationalizing abject poverty in the United States. And abject poverty in the United States is of course a very powerful weapon against the working class as a whole, and it always has been always has been. So there is no material economic interest that is somehow at odds with the moral interest. So that should be borne in mind. In other words, the way that we might think of these things is, is proceeding on false premises to begin with. Um, there are no workers who have ever had an interest in racism at a material economic level because racism has always served as an ideology to justify the suppression of labor as a whole. Or as Marx said, labor in the white skin cannot be emancipated when enslaved in the black skin. So what did he mean by that? Is that just a moral sentiment? Or is that a matter of actual material, societal, including economic, but also political, practice, right? Is that like a practical issue? And again, we now, and I would say that this is the counter-revolutionary ideology that dominates, we think that one section of the working class has a material interest against another section of the working class. No, not from a socialist perspective, no. Not from a socialist perspective. From a capitalist perspective, sure. But from a socialist perspective, no. All right. Thank you so much for your lecture and your time, Chris. And thank you to all of our audience members for participating. Um, next week, as Chris mentioned, I believe we will have Pam speaking on the Jacksonian Revolution. Um, and it'll also be the 4th of July. So. Um, okay, well, great. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone. Um, check out our website um, for any updates, platypus1917.org. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so we ended the recording. Um,
anything else?